A lot of you asked um, under the last video about the Infidel filament diameter sensor to see more details about my filament extruder. And yeah, that's this video. This is a video that I didn't originally plan on making, but because so many of you asked for it, here it is. Now, I want to preface this with this isn't a how to build a filament extruder video. This is more of a how not to build a filament extruder because this one, while it, it did actually produce some very good ABS filament um, made from this uh, Samsung Polylac, this is 747S. Um, you know, that's the, the only filament or the only resin that I ever used. Um, basically just, uh, you know, natural color ABS. This is a high flow ABS and it's the only material I ever tried with this um, because ABS is a bit easier to work with. But anyways, um, this is an extruder that I built during my first engineering semesters um, with the goal to have, you know, a filament extruder that would be capable of making filament at a pace that was actually going to be you know, practical. With the filler extruders of the time, you know, a spool took way too long for my taste. So this was built roughly with the goal of doing, you know, one to two kilograms an hour. And that was the biggest downfall of the project because my goal was way too high and my budget as a student was way too low to actually achieve it. So there are a lot of quite hacky solutions in here that we're going to go through step by step. Really, the only reason I still have this is because I wanted to make a video on it at some point. And after this video, this is going bye bye, unfortunately. So this entire extruder was a evolutionary process and it started out bit by bit. The first thing I made was the auger and melt zone area of this entire extruder, which is a stainless steel tube with a, well, an auger drill basically all the way through it. At the front, we have a pressed in steel, well, slug essentially, and then these replaceable screw heads, basically these screws that are drilled for a specific diameter. This is a 2.5 millimeter one, which with dice well and everything, I think worked out pretty well actually. The melt zone in this heater barrel is three different zones that each have their own thermistor, their own heater, so these are individually controlled and they're quite dusty by now because this thing hasn't been used for a while. Um, that worked fantastically, that actually worked really well. Um, what didn't work so well was the way that I tried to drive it initially, which was to just attach a drill to that auger and to, you know, run that drill until it smoked and eventually gave up. That like that lasted for a bit and it did make a bit of filament, but that filament wasn't very good. But the other thing I noticed was that the auger drill was actually pushing itself out the back because there was nothing really holding it into um, the stainless steel pipe. There was a bearing to center it, but that was it. So first order of business was to build a thrust bearing assembly and this is way overbuilt, but it was fun to build. I had just gotten my mini lathe at the time and, you know, just make a, making a few bearing seats and uh, a few shafts and stuff. That was super fun. And in the end, you know, this thrust bearing, I think is the best part of the entire extruder. The other thing I did was to upgrade, well, to upgrade, to replace the drive motor from the drill to one of these wiper motors. The idea was, well, these, these motors are reasonably sized and, you know, they have a, they have a warm gear drive built into, you know, each one. At the end, I ended up using two, but there is a warm gear built in and it is producing roughly the correct RPM range that I would need to drive the auger at the flow rates that I wanted. Now, just one of them wasn't enough to drive everything. I eventually added, you know, the uh, gearing with just bicycle chains and sprockets and that worked, that worked well. Um, I also added a second one, as you can see, and over time I also added active RPM control to the motors just to keep everything a bit more consistent. And that was actually the solution that got me some filament that was very usable. I got a couple of meters of fairly accurate um, three millimeter ABS filament out of it, and it did print. Like this stuff actually printed, this, this Polylac 747S, it prints like a dream, it prints like a charm. Um, the only problem was, drive unit didn't last too long and uh, well it started burning up started smoking up so I, I stopped that extrusion but I had some filament I had made some filament with this um, that was again very very usable and actually better than I was hoping for but it didn't stop at that the drive motor issue that was something that was solvable like you can buy drive motors with a warm gear at approximately the correct um, torque and RPM range, you can buy those for about 200, 250 bucks. 
that's not a problem. Um, the problem was the 250 bucks. At the time that I was building this, that was a lot of money to invest into something that I didn't know would be much value. Um, again, if I were to build this again today, I would build it totally differently. I did, however, add a few more lower cost additions to this extruder um, that were more of a DIY and less of a buy and put it in approach. So the first one of those is this um, cooling tank assembly, essentially. So it's a larger basin on the outside. You can see it's, it's uh, got a ton of scale on there because our water is pretty hard here. It's got a larger tank on the outside, a pump on the inside that pumps it into this smaller pool and the filament just runs through basically being submerged in water in this small tank. And that worked fantastically. It was just, the problem is it's open. So it was, um, it was splashing all over my electronics, which ah, wasn't the greatest thing to have. The other thing, of course, is the filament diameter sensor. I showed this in the last video as being the precursor to um, the Infidel. But the thing is, this isn't the first filament diameter sensor that I tried making for this filament extruder. Before this, I had tried making an optical sensor using an LED and a lens that was basically turning the light into parallel beams, and then a linear CCD sensor at the back. And that's something that has been suggested in the Infidel videos a lot as well. The thing is, back when I did it, um, working with that CCD sensor and making sense of that data was a bit past my pay grade at the time and you know the data you're getting is just just needs a lot of work to get you an actual diameter out of uh, 128 uh, black and white pixel values so that was something that i deemed just being too complex and there were issues with uh, filaments of different color or transparent translucent filaments those would really mess with the measurements so eventually i did go with the mechanical hall effect sensor type uh, the last thing that's on here is this filament puller. This is a stepper motor at the back and basically, you know, a bit of gearing, uh, two rubber coated wheels that just pull the filament out. That's no big thing. But this was also a part of the control scheme for this entire extruder. There were basically three things that I was going to control on this machine. The first one was going to be the RPM of the auger. So um, at first I tried to measure the RPM of the motor with this little motor using it as a generator and just using the analog voltage that was producing based on how fast these motors were spinning. Um, then I switched to an optical encoder as you can see here and the goal was to have the main Arduino that's controlling this entire thing um, just basically real time do a PID loop and you know keep these at constant RPM as much as possible. So that was option number one for trying to get a consistent diameter by actively controlling the entire thing. Um, the second thing, of course, is varying the temperatures on the heater. So three zones, basically the front two ones are kind of like preheat ones. And then the last one um, would dictate how hot the filament would come out of the nozzle. And that was something that was working pretty well. I wasn't using it for active diameter control, but these were kept very consistently at their temperature. And the last thing is this puller. So by varying how fast I was pulling the filament out of the nozzle or away from the nozzle, I could vary how thick that filament was going to be. Now having all that and trying to add that into one big control scheme is a bit challenging because, you know, essentially you have a dead time system um, between where you measure it and where you extrude it. And those are a bit tricky to control for, you know, third semester uh, engineering student. But I think the idea was, was good. So the control electronics for this entire thing, as you can see, is an Arduino Mega controlling the entire thing. Um, you know, a couple of buttons for inputs for starting the extrusion, stopping it, etc. A Nokia LCD screen. You may have used these too. These were kind of cool because you could get them for like a $1.50. Um, I don't even know if these were new ones. You could just plug these into an Arduino and you would have some sort of a graphical interface. Um, again, it's basically the cheapest way to get some sort of a display attached to your Arduino, at least it was in 2013, 14, 15. And outside of that, it was just a couple of MOSFETs and a voltage regulator for controlling the heaters and the motors. So, you know, really basic stuff, actually. The mechanical part definitely was the bigger challenge. Now, what went wrong? Why didn't this thing really work out um, the way I wanted it to? Um, there are a couple of things that I wrote down, you know, onto my notes is, first of all, the flow rate was way too high for what I was able to achieve with 
the budget and the skills that I had at the time. So again, the goal was to make you know, one or two spools of filament an hour, which is not that much less than what actual filament producers uh, manage to do on their, you know, full-scale commercial machines. I did a test once with, um, you know, trying to see how much torque it would take to actually spin the auger, and I think I got to around 50 Newton meters just to, to spin it, so you'd still need headroom above that, at around 30 RPM, which again is not impossible, but it's just something that takes a proper drive system to actually do that. The other thing I should have done is to choose a smaller auger for this entire thing. Now, a larger auger obviously is going to need more torque to drive it because your, your lever basically is going to be larger. Um, I chose this size, I think this is a 25 or a 20, a 20, 20, between 20 and 25 millimeters auger. Um, I chose this size because it was like the optimal size that you, know, you supposedly use for screw extruders like this, which is your, your clearance is roughly about you know, three times the size um, of your filament pellets. And that worked out well with the uh, 20, 25, I don't know what size it is exactly, but it doesn't matter. That worked out to be that size auger. Now, the problem is with that size auger comes a certain speed that you have to push the filament at. And again, that just made driving the entire thing super challenging. Also, what I realized a bit after I had used this thing and tried to start it up again is that, you know, because there's no heat break as you have in a 3D printer hardened, there's just, you know, a continuous stainless steel tube, um, the molten area of the pellets of the resin actually crept towards um, my hopper here and there's now a plug that is basically sealing this entire thing shut. I can't really spin the auger anymore, I can't push filament through it because this area up here, which has no heater attached to it, is, well, it's now clogged up. There's a block of plastic in there. And lastly, what definitely didn't help was um, trying to build this thing on a near zero budget. Like the entire budget for all these parts, I think was 200 euros, maybe. You know, it's using an old ATX supply wiper motors for the cheapest car I could find, and otherwise just parts off the shelf or scraps that I had. The problem with that is that you end up buying parts that are like just below what you need. So you can, you can kind of see them working, but they don't work well. So you buy cheap, you, you have to throw it out, you have to buy something better again. Um, what's the saying? Buy cheap, buy twice. That's definitely the issue with this. If I had built this today, if I had built this with, you know, a bit of a budget, maybe 500 bucks or something, this would be a lot better. This would be a capable filament extruder, well, at least I think it would be. Um, but yeah, trying to build something too cheaply, not a great idea, especially when there's not like a huge ecosystem of parts already like there is with 3D printers where you can get a, a decent machine for 200 bucks. Nothing about this is off the shelf and proven. This is all custom components that I tried to come up with uh, and, you know, honestly really didn't have a clue of what I was looking for. So I hope that was helpful, entertaining to you if you're planning to build an extruder or maybe you aren't, maybe you're just interested in, you know, the challenges that you run into. I don't know, with filament getting so good and so cheap these days, I don't know if it makes a lot of sense to, you know, try and DIY it unless you want to experiment with custom materials that have additives in it or, you know, special colors or, or stuff like that. In that case, there's nothing beating your own filament extruder. In any case, I would like to thank my patrons who are supporting me um, on a monthly basis. Without you guys, um, like, I, like I keep on saying, this entire channel wouldn't be possible, so a big thank you to all of you. If you want to join in too, we do regular Q&A hangouts. The link to Patreon is right there. Um, but yeah, for everyone, thank you for watching, keep on making, and I will see you in the next one.